Okay, you're on. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, back to the lecture series, Algorithmic Sustainable Design, the Future of Architectural Theory. Today, we're having the fourth lecture. And I will try to uh, cover these topics, cellular automata, the Sierpinski gasket, and the seashells. And then um, I will talk about design in hyperspace and connection to the sacred. So I have a lot to do today, and uh, I will try to, to uh, relate everything, uh, these uh, disparate sounding phenomena. But uh, after all, uh, I'm digging at the, uh, at the foundations of architectural theory, and we have a lot to do, uh, because uh, uh, according to uh, my estimation, uh, there has been a gap for several hundred years. Now, there's a, there's a fundamental difference in this lecture, and I want to alert uh, the listeners and, and viewers of, of this lecture. Unlike the previous lectures, I'm not going to give practical model for design or practical rules, even though um, I'm going to look at uh, mathematical models and, and, uh, and spend a great deal of time looking at details of these models, the cellular automata. But altogether, I'm, I'm putting together uh, ideas from computer science, physics, mathematics, and even spirituality, and I'm trying to make a soup out of these ideas, and I work from analogy. And uh, so all the technical uh, information will be given is meant as an analogy, trying to get into the foundations of architecture, and not as, as a uh, design rules like I gave earlier, distribution and measuring lengths in order to get a good design. So please keep that in mind. Uh, I want to relate the basis of architecture to other disciplines. Because in my, in my opinion, uh, architecture during the 20th century isolated itself from the technological world and all of technology's impressive advances. Now, before uh, some listeners get uh, uh, to disagreeing with the statement, I admit that architecture is based on technology, but it is an applied technology. The design concept itself, however, still comes from an artistic basis, whether architects want to admit it or not. Even the most uh, technologically oriented architects uh, don't use uh, science in the way that I, a scientist, or Christopher Alexander, a scientist, uh, use science. So I would, um, we're really coming back from, from, a, from a different uh, perspective, and that's what I want to, uh, to do with this lecture and all the lectures. Now, confronted with architecture and the problem of design, designing buildings and cities, it is one of the most complex problems that the human beings can, can confront. Now, when scientists uh, face such a highly complex problem, we often create a toy model, which is something out of, say, Legos, uh, something very, very simple that tries to reproduce uh, some of the mechanisms. And then we play with that. Uh, scientists are playing all the time. That's why uh, it's so much fun to be a scientist. You play with a model, and uh, if this model um, reproduces some of the uh, mechanisms in your complex system that you're studying, then you get an insight into what is happening, and that insight from playing around with the toy model will help you to solve the real problem. Now, this is in contrast with attacking the real problem directly, because often it is so complex as to elude even comprehension, let alone a solution. Let me begin now uh, the, the lecture uh, subject proper with cellular automata. What are cellular automata? Uh, they are arrays in which cells can assume different states. We can put different numbers in the arrays, or we can color them in different colors. Uh, the, in this lecture, I'm just going to talk about the simplest type of cellular automata uh, in which uh, the cells assume binary states, either black, on, or white, off. And we can uh, uh, use the uh, computer uh, notation, on is plus one and, and off is zero. So um, these uh, cellular automata change their state in different times, and the times are discrete, one, two, three, four, five. And uh, an algorithm that defines the automaton decides how the cells will change in discrete times. So I'm going to uh, further uh, look at the simplest possible automata by um, going to one-dimensional, 1D means one-dimensional, cellular automata. 
a one-dimensional uh, cellular automaton is a single line of cells. The algorithm will generate the next state. So let me begin immediately by looking at one rule. One rule that I'm going to use uh, during today's talk is turn black if either neighbor is black, turn white if both neighbors are either black or white. A very simple rule. And uh, in order to begin constructing this cellular automaton, I have to uh, specify where we begin. So let me begin with the simplest possible uh, initial condition where all the states are off except for a single on in the middle somewhere. And here is a picture. We have a single line of, of uh, cells at, uh, at time equals zero, and one in the middle is on, and the rest are off. Now, according to the rules I just gave, uh, the, the, uh, the two cells, the two off cells on either side turn on, but the uh, cell in the middle, the original cell, turns off, and so on. Ap applying these rules, I get the time evolution of the cellular automaton, and it goes to t equals 2, t equals 3, t equals 4, t equals 5, and you see that I'm getting nice uh, patterns, pretty patterns, uh, and, uh, of course, time can continue uh, infinitely. And uh, I get all these patterns. And this is the cellular automaton. If, uh, if I had a, um, a, a, an online computer connection, I could show how this thing evolves, but we don't need that. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this by hand. As, as, I, as I said, sometimes the simplest uh, explanation uh, is, is the clearest. Now, this cellular automaton uh, is not presented as a design tool. I'm, I, I'm uh, strictly looking at creating an analogy for understanding architectural design. And I don't mean these patterns to be used directly. This is, this is a problem with talking to architects. They think that when I give a lecture and I show diagrams that these are meant to be copied to, to, build, a, to build a building. But no, no, I'm trying to establish a, a, um, an idea an analogy of thought in order to look at the foundations of architectural design. And, and the actual sketches for a building are going to look totally different than, than what I'm showing today. And the, the reason is that what I talk about does not have the right complexity to be useful in adaptive design. Here is a more concise formulation of the uh, cellular automaton I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking at, the one I just sketched, the first few states. Uh, if, I, uh, if I let the state of the cell at position J on the line and at time T, and I denote it A sub J of T, then the value of A sub J of T can be either 0 or 1. And how do I get the, that number? Well, I have a recursive algorithm. The cell state at time T plus 1 depends upon the two neighbors. So A J of, of T plus 1 is the state of, of my cell in the um, following step of time, t plus 1. And that depends on the existing states of its neighbors. aj minus 1 is the neighbor on the left, and aj plus 1 is the neighbor on the right. So each one of these numbers can be a 0 or a 1. I add them together, and I take it modulo 2. Uh, everyone knows what modulo 2 means. If you get, if you get a, a 1, it's a 1. If you get a 0, it's a 0. If you get a 2, it becomes a 0. If you get a 3, it becomes a 1. So uh, odd numbers are, um, are 1, are equal to 1, and even numbers are equal to 0. So that's what we mean by modulo 2. This is just a, a restatement in, math, in the mathematical uh, formula of the rule I gave earlier. And here is even a third formulation of the same cellular automaton. The notation <coughs> is um, the pound sign can be either on or off. So if I have a 1 pound 1, it becomes a 0 in the middle. If I have a 0 pound 0, it becomes 0 in the middle. If I have a 0 pound 1, it becomes a 1 in the middle. And if I have a 1 pound 0, it becomes a 1 in the middle. <coughs> so again, it's, it's another way of writing the same rule. Now, the initial condition is extremely important here because the, um, the state of the cellular automata depends upon the previous state. All the, all the um, cells are on or off, they, they influence uh, all the later developments. So the initial condition, what you start with at time equals zero, 
uh, determines all the later development. This example began with what, just one black pixel on, and the pattern grows to infinite length. There are many different cellular automata, and I have used Rule 90. Rule 90 refers to a classification given by the uh, computer scientist Stephen Wolfram in a, a new kind of science, that's his, his big book, classifying all of cellular automata. And uh, the one that, that I'm choosing to talk about today, uh, he labels Rule 90. That's why I keep referring to it uh, as Rule 90. Now, there are many other cellular automata that give different rules. Here is Stephen Wolf Wolfram's book. Very interesting if you like, uh, <coughs> if you like algorithms and uh, computer science. <coughs> I'm not recommending it as, as a textbook in architecture because there's nothing um, about architecture in it, but it's a, it's a great um, uh, achievement. Now, I want to, um, to focus on something <coughs> on the cellular automata that, that I'm using. There are many different types of cellular automata, but rule 90 is the nearest neighbor rule, namely that everything depends upon the immediate uh, neighbor on the left and the immediate neighbor on the right. And that is the shortest possible interaction distance. It, it's a very local uh, cellular automaton. We can have different cellular automata, which I, I can discuss later, that have a long interaction distance. But I'm, I'm sticking now to the shortest interaction distance in order to derive a, um, a surprising result. And the result is going to be that from the local cellular automaton, I'm going to get long-range behavior. And this is of profound importance to, uh, to architecture and urbanism, and I will try to tie into that later. Namely, I'm doing something very simple on a very local scale, nearest neighbor interaction, and that will have long-range effects and, and uh, generate uh, long-range patterns. And, and that uh, is, uh, is, is important for, uh, for my uh, uh, results. Now, uh, b before I, I, I go on, I, I want to come back to, to, um, to what I think are misguided applications. Uh, Stephen Wolfram's book has become rather popular in, in uh, cutting-edge architecture, and Wolfram himself, with whom I am in contact, is being invited to our, uh, our best architecture schools to give talks. And uh, there's something worrying about this, because uh, I, from what I read in the literature, uh, some of our architectural theorists are taking his, uh, his ideas about generating cellular automata and are applying them to create uh, interesting looking forms. And are there, they are then uh, proposing to make buildings in these shapes. Well, I think that's, it's, it's not a correct application because uh, the uh, Wolfram cellular automata are just a set of examples. These are mathematical examples that have nothing to do with uh, buildings because th there is no part of the algorithm that is adaptive. So this is not adaptive design. This is abstract design. They're very useful for analogies, and I'm using them exactly for that end uh, in this lecture and throughout the series of lectures, but they're not uh, suitable for design models. Let me continue now to uh, seashells and other interesting things like Sierpinski carpets. The cellular automaton Rule 90 generates a digitized version of the Sierpinski fractal triangle, which we have... Uh, uh, looked at in, in uh, previous lectures in the series. Now, uh, remember that the cellular automaton is, uh, it depends on two things. It depends on the algorithm, and we have rule 90, so that's the same algorithm we've been using. Uh, and we are going to keep the initial condition that I introduced, namely uh, a single on in the middle and the rest are, are off. Uh, the cells in the line are off. However, different initial conditions will generate distinct fractal triangles. And I will give an example later in this talk. So I just want to say I'm sticking to the initial uh, diagrams that I drew for the Rule 90 cellular automaton. And just to uh, refresh your memory, this is the Sierpinski fractal triangle. Uh, not very uh, complete because I'm just showing three levels of scale. And as we know, the triangles... Uh, in the, in the corners here, where you get the smaller triangles, there will be further subdivision into even smaller triangles and then smaller subdivisions of those down to an infinitesimal 
Uh, so th this uh, Sterpinski fractal triangle just shows three scales uh, and, not, and not the full fractal. Uh, but this is a very popular fractal, so you can, you can find uh, a, uh, a better picture in, a, in any book on fractals. So where am I going with this? I'm trying to lay down the logical framework for adaptive algorithms. And uh, even though I'm not going to talk about actual algorithms today, uh, I will give the, uh, the, the basis for the logical framework. When we discover design rules that um, generate a complex structure, like a building or a city, then uh, that building or city will not look like these pretty uh, fractals that I'm, I'm looking at, or that, that um, um, Stephen Wolfram has, has in his book. Uh, I'm just using these as analogies. A, a city or, or, a, or a building looks totally different. What, what is important, however, is that it has the coherent features of the fractal. So I'm looking at mathematical features that a fractal has, and I'm saying that these features that are easy to see on the mathematical fractal, and here they are, and I'm showing them, and I'm discussing how they arise, these same features uh, also occur in, a, in an adaptive building and in an adaptive city, in an adaptive neighborhood, in an adaptive urban space. So that by learning from a very simple but unrealistic uh, mathematical uh, model, a toy model, then I'm ready to, to, um, to discuss the qualities for real life uh, architectural and urban design. Now I'm going to discuss a weaving a carpet. One of uh, Christopher Alexander's favorite um, favorite things, you know, Christopher Alexander has a, a, a phenomenal connection, collection of Oriental carpets and uh, learned a lot about architecture from them. Well, this is a, a, an activity uh, that uh, human beings have carried out all through uh, since the beginnings of history. And we have found the woven carpets. Uh, the the Pazirik carpet uh, was found in, uh, in in Russia, frozen in in the ice, and it dates from uh, classical Greek times. Not made by classical Greeks, made by uh, the nomadic um, nomadic people uh, in in Russia. But uh, the the weavings have gone on for millennia uh, all over the Middle East, the Islamic world, in Northern Africa. Uh, um, independent the weaving tradition of. Um, of, of the uh, American uh, people, indigenous peoples, uh, pre-Columbian, uh, more flat weave than carpet, however, but still, all the weaving tradition uh, comes with making cloth. So uh, this is not a lecture on carpets, it's a lecture on cellular automata. Uh, what is the connection? Well, when you weave a carpet, you sit down on, on the loom and you, you knot one line of knots from wool. Uh, and you're not a pattern, uh, depending on what you have. You're not, say, two knots white wool, and then three knots blue, and then uh, two knots red, etc. and you go horizontally uh, across the, the line. This is called a, a, a warp line. And, um, and uh, this is a very complex pattern, because you're just looking at a single line that comes into the pattern. And when, when you weave that line, you, uh, you go and you weave the second line. And after that, you look at the carpet and it's, it's a beautiful uh, pattern from the top. Uh, but um, each line is rather complex to weave. Now, in order to, to handle this complexity, in uh, many of these cultures that, uh, that are, uh, are nomadic, uh, the information, the complex information that contains the code for weaving each line of the carpet has often been made into a song so that the, uh, the master weaver sings the song uh, that tells uh, how many knots of, of each color and then followed by how many knots of another color. Um, it is a compactification of information. Otherwise, it, it's, it's just too much for the human mind to, um, to get. And uh, uh, from what we know, all the carpets, or most of the carpets we know, have a regular pattern. So the repetition and the fractal structure, the recursion of the single line, uh, then contributes to give the pattern in two dimensions. And this is a key point of, of this uh, lecture. What happens is that we get 
a space-time diagram, both in the carpet and in the cellular automaton. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, one line is the space where you lay the knots, where you tie the knots horizontally, say, or where you uh, fill in the cellular automaton, which has black or white uh, cells. And then you, uh, you um, juxtapose all the different um, states of the cellular automaton or the carpet next to each other. So one axis is x, the space axis, and the other axis is t, the time axis, which shows the development. And then you, you plot this on a space-time diagram. And nothing to do with, with Einsteinian relativity. This is just a, a representation. The space-time diagram is the two-dimensional carpet where um, uh, you see uh, how the thing uh, evolves. And here I have uh, put together the cellular automaton 90 with the initial condition that we have chosen, and you see that it's starting to weave a Sierpinski carpet. You go down as increasing as time increases, t equals 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., and you keep going to as, lo as long as you want. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it's beginning already to, uh, to create triangles, self-similar triangles. And if we continue, the thing gets bigger and bigger. The triangle gets bigger and bigger. And it will, it will look more and more like the Sierpinski gasket. So this is a really amazing uh, result. We are able to weave the two-dimensional Sierpinski triangle with the rule 90 cellular automaton, which is one-dimensional. Now, there is a difference here in that the carpet is a digitized fractal because there is a minimum pixel size, one cell, whereas the pure mathematical fractal uh, is, uh, is, is created very differently. It's created by going in and cut and, and, and uh, drawing small and smaller, smaller triangles, whereas this is, this is more like a picture on a computer screen. There is a minimum pixel size. Uh, however, we can uh, we get around this just the, the same way that the audiovisual uh, information gets around that. If we make the uh, Sierpinski carpet large enough, then the pixel size gets very small compared to the to the overall size, and it vanishes to the limit of human perception. And then, uh, if we uh, if we weave the Sierpinski carpet large enough, it looks like a perfect fractal, even though it's not. This visual example shows emergence which uh, is important for, uh, for, uh, for architecture and urbanism. Namely, what has happened? A recursive one-dimensional algorithm that acts on a single line of cells involving only nearest neighbor interactions has generated a nested design, a two-dimensional fractal on a plane. There is nothing in the cellular automaton to lead us to expect such complex long-range patterns that can be seen only in two dimensions. All the scaling distribution, uh, the scaling coherence, the scaling symmetries of the Sierpinski gas gasket arise from this extremely simple uh, cellular automaton. So it's time for an architectural conclusion, since I have talked a lot without any explicit architectural content. And again, by analogy, I have shown that the simplest possible one-dimensional binary algorithm generates large-scale order. In its generated pattern, which is the two-dimensional carpet, all the characteristics of the coherence, geometrical coherence, are present, namely scaling hierarchy, scaling symmetry, scaling distribution, some symmetries. And the question is, can we use very simple rules to create great buildings and cities? So I think that uh, I have demonstrated by a single example, by analogy, that the answer is yes. And I can spend the, the, the remaining um, lectures in this series proving that. But I think that's, it's sufficient information for, uh, for people to think about and to make the connection. The answer is yes, definitely. So what are the uh, very simple algorithms that we can use to generate a large-scale architectural urban order? Well, first of all, we have form languages that I discuss in my book, A Theory of Architecture. Form languages are simple vocabulary of forms that uh, people developed in traditional architectures, a different language for each different tradition. And uh, by using the form language, uh, you get very simple rules, and they create very complex buildings. 
uh, but each building has a, um, a characteristic look. So suppose we go to, to Upper Egypt and we see the vernacular architecture. It is a, it is a product of a form language. Uh, that's tied into the to that particular region, to the culture, to the time, to the available materials. Uh, so it's very simple rules used by, by the local people who most of them build their own houses, create extremely adaptive uh, houses, much more adaptive than uh, American suburban houses that, that uh, waste so much energy and, uh, and deplete all, the, all our um, uh, oil resources and everything else. Um, you go to another part of the world, in Indonesia, and uh, even in Indonesia, there may be 15 different form languages, depending on, on the region uh, that you're in. So the form language uh, is a, a, an algorithm that, that contains information, rather simple information, that can be used to create an adaptive building or a city. We use the same form languages on the urban scale, different vocabulary on the urban scale, to create a traditional type of city. And people for millennia have been building uh, buildings and cities using form languages. So that's, that's uh, the, the answer to my, um, to my own question. Uh, how about today for those uh, who want to be modern and don't want to use uh, traditional form languages? Well, there is a smart code. And the smart code is introduced by the new urbanists, including uh, my friend uh, Andres Duany and his wife Elizabeth Plata Zyberg. The smart code embodies a core algorithm that creates adaptive environments, adaptive for human beings. And it's a very simple code, just like a, a cellular automaton, and I will, I will discuss the uh, smart code uh, in, a, um, in a subsequent lecture. But this, this is an algorithm that will create adaptive environments. And all over the United States now, municipalities are adopting smart code. Not because they, they, they have uh, taken the trouble to look into the theoretical um, um, background for this, but no, they have seen other municipalities that have adopted the smart code, and they see that this thing is growing, and it has a human scale, and people love to live there, and the real estate prices go up, whereas um, municipalities that uh, keep uh, the old uh, suburban sprawl zoning codes are just as, just as dreary as, as, any, uh, as any awful suburbia with strip malls uh, today. So, so this, is a, uh, this is to be observed, that, that the smart code that creates adaptive environments. Now, the adaptation, uh, you may or may not um, uh, uh, object to my, use, uh, to my use of the word adaptive. How can a single code create adaptive environments? And, and the answer is that um, the smart code contains a core which is universal. It can be applied anywhere in the world with some calibration. The calibration makes it adaptive to the local requirements. And then the pieces that add onto the code are specific lo uh, specifically location and culture dependent. So those parts of the smart code make it uh, adaptive. But uh, this is not the time to talk about the, uh, the smart code. That comes later. So uh, let me get back to, uh, to the concept of emergence, because this is so important in, um, in architecture and urbanism. The simple rule creates a complex pattern that is not explicit in the initial code, yet it must be there some, somehow. It's in the DNA. But if you look at the DNA, you certainly don't read. If you look at the DNA of an elephant, you certainly don't read large animal with big floppy ears and, and giant tusks. You, you cannot read that, but it's there. It's all coded there. Uh, so from our point of view, the self-similarity and the scaly coherence must be there somehow, but it's certainly not, not obvious. The emergent geometrical patterns are seen only in the higher dimension than the one the algorithm acts on. What algorithm have we used uh, to get all my results today? A one-dimensional algorithm, a one-dimensional um, row of cells. And, and what have I gotten? I've gotten a beautiful triangular patterns on two dimensions. So you, you cannot see the original, uh, you cannot see the symmetries in the original dimensionality. That, that's important for, for discussing later. Now, is there an animal that has applied a cellular automaton to build this house directly? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, several uh, seashells, marine mollusks, have used the fractal uh, algorithm to build their, their shell. The tent olive shell, the damons volute, the textile cone, 
and the glory of the sea. Uh, how does the animal do that? Well, the animal lives in a, in a small shell and then grows the shell by laying down a calcium carbonate on the lip of the shell, so the, the shell grows in a helical uh, fashion. And uh, apparently, uh, these shells, uh, no, the animals living in the shell um, have uh, the knowledge to, um, to use a one-dimensional um, um, cellular automaton in order to create a Sierpinski-like pattern. So these animals are much cleverer than we uh, give them credit for. And here is one seashell that has a not very well, um, the pattern is not very well drawn. But uh, maybe, um, well, these are, these are uh, clever animals, but not as clever as the octopus, say, which is much cleverer. So, uh, but there's something going on here, and you can see that uh, it looks um, Sierpinski-like, and some are, are more Sierpinski-like than others. But it's certainly, it's obviously a, a uh, cellular automaton. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So what is amazing here is that the, the mollusk is using an algorithm, a, a one-dimensional cellular automaton, to build its house. Now, the, the mollusk never gets to see the outside of its shell, like we go outside to see our houses and inspect if they look pretty or not, um, because it always lives inside the shell. Uh, the eyes are not as highly developed, um, and uh, even, even uh, more amazing is that many of these shells, while they're alive, the shell is covered with a with a membrane, organic membrane, so the pattern is not all that clear to see. Well, the shells we buy at the shelf shop uh, are dead and they have been cleared. The membrane has been cleared off, so we see the pattern very nicely. Anyway, these these are um, unanswerable questions. I'm going to take a little detour to relate the um, the uh, one-dimensional cellular automaton again, Rule 90, to uh, the binomial theorem. The binomial theorem is one of the great achievements of, uh, of mathematics in history. It was uh, developed by Sir Isaac Newton in the Cambridge, uh, uh, England. Now, binomial coefficients are the numbers that come out when you expand a plus b to the nth power. And all these numbers, which are the binomial coefficients, they can be computed from Pascal's triangle. Uh, Pascal, Blaise Pascal is a French mathematician that lived um, after Newton. And uh, by some uh, mathematical uh, steps that you don't need to, to follow, here if, if I were giving a lecture series to mathematical class, I will, I will go through all these steps. But it's just uh, of general interest that somehow from, uh, from the binomial um, theorem you get the Sierpinski triangle again. And back to the seashells. So how does this work? Here is a binomial expansion. A plus B quantity squared is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. And those coefficients are what is, what's important. The coefficients are 1. It's the coefficient of A squared. 2 is the coefficient of 2AB. And 1 is, again, coefficient of B squared. So those numbers are 1, 2, 1. For the cube, the coefficients are 1, 3, 3, and 1. And for the fourth power, the coefficients are 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So I don't care about the A's and B's. I just care about the coefficients. So here I have, I'm going to write down the coefficients, and I get what's known as Pascal's triangle. So you see 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. Uh, again, making a diversion from a diversion, this has a, a very beautiful structure because every entry in Pascal's triangle is the sum of the top two entries. For example, look at the 4, and above the 4, you have a 1 and a 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. Look at the 10. Above the 10, we have a 4 and a 6. 4 plus 6 is 10. So things are adding up to generate the, uh, the lower rows of the Pascal triangle, and we can continue indefinitely. So we have gone away now from uh, expanding powers of A plus B to just uh, adding up numbers. And here is the, the algorithm for uh, generating the rows of Pascal's triangle. Just add the, uh, add the two numbers that already exist in the triangle to get the number um, directly beneath, beneath them. And you continue to generate more rows. The result, this is the result I want. I take the Pascal, uh, Pascal's triangle that I have uh, 
written for you with all those numbers, and I take it and I rewrite it modulo 2. You remember what modulo 2 says? All, either, all uh, even numbers become 0, and all odd numbers become 1. So this is Pascal's triangle modulo 2, and lo and behold, we have the Sierpinski triangle. So we have obtained the Sierpinski now from the binomial theorem rather than from a cellular automaton. What does this all mean? Well, this, is, um, this links things together in a way that, uh, that makes possible um, new ideas and new theories. The classification of cellular automata. Stephen Wolfram has classified all 256 possible one-dimensional cellular automata with binary states, namely on and off, or zero and one, and nearest neighbor interactions. 20 of them, of the 256, generate variants of the Sierpinski gasket, whereas others are not regular. So that's 8% of all possible cellular automata. Now, we don't really care about cellular automata with binary states and nearest neighbor interactions, but I'm getting a figure. I'm getting a figure about the, um, the selection of, of algorithms. The useful algorithms are going to be very few. In this example, I get 8% of all possible algorithms that have anything to do with the problem at hand. And the problem at hand is not, is not even building a house. The problem at hand is, is creating a, a beautiful triangle with internal symmetries. So out of, um, uh, out of uh, an enormous number of possible generative codes, very few of them can be possible architectural algorithms. So um, having established the uh, possibility, or not the, even the possibility, have, having established the existence of algorithms for design of buildings and cities, and having mentioned to you the, uh, that a traditional building and architecture uses such algorithms. Now we ask, how do you decide if a particular algorithm is useful or not? And this is the topic of, an, of, uh, of uh, following lectures. However, even at this stage we can say most algorithms that you can find lying around or dream up are not going to be adaptive. A very, very small number of all possible algorithms can be used for adaptive design. This is, this is what um, the, the previous slide um, uh, demonstrates. To select algorithms, therefore, we are going to need some criteria, and those criteria are going to be developed in, in following lectures. To use the examples that I have at hand, the rule 90. Why is rule 90 useful? Well, for two reasons. I see it in biological structures. I see it in the seashells. So there must be something to rule 90 that's important. And also, it's related to the binomial theorem. And most people listening to me will not know that rule 90 was related to the binomial theorem. So this unexpected, these unexpected relations and, and applications to natural structures, biological structures, single out Rule 90 as something, uh, something special. A and that's why it gives the, the beautiful patterns. Now, again, I'm not going to use Rule 90 to build anything. It is just that uh, one, I'm, I'm motivating why I single it out. Before I'm finished with Rule 90, I'm going to go back to what I promised you. And that Rule 90 does not only generate the Sierpinski triangle. It generates beautiful nested hierarchical patterns that don't look like the Sierpinski triangle. And the way to do that is to begin with a different initial condition. As I said earlier, the entire pattern depends on the initial condition. So let me begin with a different initial condition, namely 11001, and see how that develops. This is how it develops. So you see at the top line, the top line is black, black, white, white, black. That's 11001. And rule 90, which, is, which uh, I gave you in the beginning, uh, uh, evolves this triangle. And if you squint and look uh, carefully, you see that it is repeating. There's a nested quality. There's a repetition. 
uh, and the repetition continues. Uh, you can continue to grow this this um, cellular automaton and, and get more and more rows and get a beautiful uh, nested pattern, which is totally different from from the from the Sierpinski gasket that that um, grew from the other initial condition. Now, how many different initial conditions can you have? You can have an infinite number of different initial conditions for this rule 90. And here we have another important result. Can I say result? Not a scientific result, but a result by, uh, by analogy for design. Adaptive design is highly dependent upon initial conditions, namely the existing structures, the surroundings, the human needs, the culture, etc. The same design algorithm will result in drastically distinct end products. Therefore, the proper algorithm can be used to design buildings and cities that are each distinct because they adapt to local conditions. In my estimation, this is one of the important, most important results um, I have presented so far applicable to architecture and urbanism. Not a mathematical proof, but I think it's fairly convincing um, by the little uh, mathematical toys I have used. But, but think of it. Even a single form language applied to different sites, different initial conditions, different environments, would generate totally innovative structures that are adaptive if that algorithm is, is, is fine-tuned to generate uh, adaptive buildings and cities. So this, with one stroke, we can say, this does away with, with uh, the terror of, of restricting architectural creativity. Uh, so many uh, contemporary architects argue, well, if we start using traditional form languages, we don't, don't have any creativity left. That's, that's mathematically wrong. Because we can, I have just shown you that you can generate an infinite number of different buildings. My friends, the classical architects, know that. They know that they have a classical form language that is, that is adaptive because it has worked for many thousands of years. They can go and use a set of initial conditions on the site and generate a beautifully adaptive building that's not a copy of the Parthenon or, or any classical building. But it is classical, yes, it looks classical, it feels good, but it's... it's totally innovative. A new building using the same uh, form language but using different initial conditions. By contrast, formal design is not adaptive. And formal design can be of either two forms. One, it could be non-algorithmic. It doesn't compute anything. It just has a form a standard form, and it imposes the preconceived form onto the site, onto the, onto the, uh, imposes something as a solution that's not really computed solution. It is uh, preconceived. Uh, to, uh, it cannot possibly be adaptive. Uh, unfortunately, we see so much of that all around the world today. The second. Uh, case of, of uh, formal design that's not adaptive is, is more difficult to argue against, but it's just as, just as, uh, just as non-adaptive, because it could be algorithmic. Somebody could be computing something. And you say, well, it's computing something, so it must be adaptive. Absolutely not. It is algorithmic, but it's computing something, not responding to initial conditions. It is computing something according to internal criteria, which are self-referential. So you can have these two types of non-adaptive structures, and we see them all over the world today. We have just a cube imposed all over the world that can uh, serve for a schoolhouse or a bank or a private residence or, um, or a government building or anything. Just, as, just as the same uh, silly cube that's, that adapts to no, none of those situations. Or we have these architects who say, well, I'm going to do an uh, algorithmic design and here I'm doing an algorithmic design. I'm computing this, and the form is evolving. And look at this fantastically beautiful complex form. Well, that may or may not be adaptive, because uh, depending on the criteria. And many of these architects, I happen to know for a fact, because I read, I read their papers, and I look at and analyze their forms. They're computing according to self-referential criteria. They're not computing based on, on adaptivity. Therefore, the result may look complex, but it's, it's no better than the glass box or the concrete uh, cube. Uh, it just um, it does not uh, uh, take into account um, uh, human needs. So 
So again, I come back to the question, <coughs> how do we choose algorithms? Well, let's look at nature. Nature uses only sustainable algorithms, sustainable in the correct sense, because non-sustainable algorithms die out. So the algorithms that we observe in nature must be sustainable, otherwise we, we did not observe them. This is Darwinian selection based on the survival. It's a survival of algorithms that are, that are selected on the basis of sustainability. So it's a selection of algorithms. This is very different from the selection of forms that we normally think of as the result of evolution. When we say, well, um, the crab has a shell, as a, as a, it's of a specific form because it has been selected as an optimal shape for this marine, um, for this marine animal to, to be in. Yes, that is true. It's, it's, a, it's a selection of the form of the crab shell over uh, millions and millions of years uh, um, that has evolved. However, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about selection of algorithms, algorithms that processes that do something, that design something. It's more like the processes of, of uh, how, how um, uh, the embryo grows, of how our DNA uh, influences the, the, the growing embryo. The selection of processes is more difficult to visualize than the, than the uh, selection of a form. But unfortunately, we have to start to think about the evolution of algorithms because uh, if you take my series of talks seriously, uh, the future of architecture depends upon grasping what, what an algorithm means and then applying it to architectural and urban design. And now that brings me to uh, something that may seem totally unconnected, but um, <laughs> in fact it is, it is highly relevant. Design in hyperspace and connection to the sacred. This is totally speculative. However, I think that you will recognize that this topic is fundamentally important to architecture. For millennia, human beings have sought to connect to the sacred realm through architecture. Christopher Alexander talks about connecting to a larger coherence, something there. It is a visceral feeling. It is, this is not intellectual. This is visceral. We feel it right inside our heart, inside our, our belly. We experience this connection in a great religious building or a place of great natural beauty. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a great cathedral or one of the greatest mosques uh, uh, in the world. Uh, Hassan Fati, the, the great Egyptian architect, talk about the sacred stru structure in everyday environments. Occasionally, very rarely, we sit somewhere in a very ordinary environment and we feel totally connected, totally at peace with that. We experience this connection. Uh, it, it is a... Uh, if you have experienced it, please go back in your memory, and I'm sure you will see that it is uh, very rare in, in a post-industrial or industrial environment. Usually, we experience it in, either in a natural setting or in a traditional uh, built environment, and there's, a, there's an important reason for that. Uh, Islamic architecture has always tried to be connected. The, the, here, uh, just two sketches from uh, Cairo, 15th century Cairo. Uh, the connective elements are what uh, today uh, today's architects uh, dismiss as, as useless ornamentation, but these are the connective elements. These, these are what lead you to the higher connection. And it just shows the uh, uh, total wrong-headedness of, of, uh, of the way that uh, we misunderstand architecture today by dismissing the most important parts as, as, uh, as irrelevant. Uh, now, even talking about it, and some of my uh, listeners today, you, you may feel that, um, you may feel uneasy me talking about this. Because uh, today's Western culture does not accept a connection, a profound connection to places and buildings that connects us to something beyond reality. The Western culture does not accept this as possible. Uh, strangely enough, because we don't understand it scientifically. Well, this lecture is designed to, to give some ideas of how we can understand this scientifically, and hopefully we'll clear up this misunderstanding once and for all. Uh, let me do some mathematical uh, background, excursions to higher dimensions. Let me review the different dimensions. A line exists in one dimension. Okay, a plane exists in two dimensions, X and Y. A volume exists in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z. 
In mathematics, which I do every day, it's perfectly normal to work in any number of dimensions. We say, consider a n-dimensional vector space, and we do operations, and we solve problems, and we write papers on n-dimensional vector spaces. Uh, however, most people are not mathematicians, so uh, that, does not, uh, that does not really uh, connect to the heart of, of, of uh, normal people. But, uh, so instead, I'm going to rely on physics. From physics, we know that ordinary matter exists in several dimensions. What do I mean by that? The, the matter itself is, is composed of atoms, and atoms are composed of elementary particles. Those elementary particles exist on, on uh, different dimensions than X, Y, and Z. There are internal dimensions that lead to internal symmetries. So this is not religious speculation. This is not mathematical abstraction. This is the matter. What well, This is this stuff here. What everything is made out of exists in, in uh, other number of dimensions. And just to mention it, we have the three special dimensions, x, y, and z, and the next dimensions distinguish the particles. For example, the spin is a dimension that distinguishes bosons from fermions, different types of particles that combine together to make atoms, and atoms make your... Uh, uh, the matter of which we ourselves are made of and everything else in the world is made of. The isospin is another dimension, different from spin, that distinguishes nucleons, the, nu the, uh, the proton from the neutron, and, and creates the nucleus that, that uh, is in turn uh, linked to the, to, the, um, to the electron to make the atom. Going further in, the hypercharge is another dimension that distinguishes shorter-lived elementary particles. When we create short-lived elementary particles in accelerator, they live fractions of, of a millisecond, but the, uh, they're distinguished by another dimension, which is the hypercharge. So here, this is no longer mathematics. This is physics. How do I apply the, these concepts to, uh, to architecture? Well, I, I imagine, now this is speculation, imagine an architecture in hyperspace, a complex design or structure defined in more than three dimensions. Let me assume that the structure is richly patterned, that has symmetries, that has a scaling, that has all the, all the elements that I've been talking about for actual three-dimensional architecture. But if indeed we have an n-dimensional structure that shares all these symmetries, then we cannot perceive the totality because we can only see things in three dimensions. So we see sections of the whole n-dimensional structure. And what is a section? Well, you take a, an orange and, and you cut a slice through the orange. That's, that's a section. It's a two-dimensional section of a three-dimensional structure. And here's the central conjecture I want to make in today's talk. We connect to a higher realm only through coherent complex structures, if we connect at all. But if we do, then coherence and symmetries of form make possible the continuation into symmetries in other dimensions. Now, most of 20th century and contemporary buildings restrict forms to three dimensions or less because they are minimalist or disordered. Being minimalist or disordered structures means that they don't have the symmetries they don't have the coherence, they don't have the um, scaling hierarchy, they don't have the scaling uh, symmetry, the scaling um, distribution. So there's, according to my uh, conjecture, there's no way they can connect to anything in higher dimensions. Now, this is where I connect with the previous part of the talk. I used a one-dimensional cellular automaton to construct the two-dimensional Sierpinski gasket, and I spent half an hour doing that. I want to use this now as an analogy. We human beings build three-dimensional material structures that could generate a larger coherent structure within n-dimensional hyperspace. And then we could thus connect to the larger n-dimensional entity, which is more than we can see, because all we can see is something in three dimensions. Just with the Sierpinski gasket, which is two-dimensional, it is not possible to deduce its large-scale nested symmetries and patterns from any single section. 
But we do observe regularity in each cellular automaton with rule 90 that generated the Sierpinski gasket. So this is an important point. The geometrical coherence in what we see implies a larger coherence in n dimensions. And here I'm, there, I'm intentionally confusing two things. One dimension going to two dimensions in the Sierpinski gasket, using that as a toy model, and the most important, uh, more profound uh, conjecture that we live in three dimensions, and by creating ordered symmetric structures in three dimensions, we connect to a structure in many more dimensions. And this is the piece we see. We create it and we connect to a larger, um, to a larger state of, of being in, in, in larger dimensions, which is, sounds totally uh, crazy, but uh, I'm just laying out the groundwork for this. Now, I'm using our toy model. Here is the Sierpinski gasket, and I will take a line through. This is one section of the Sierpinski gasket. Uh, let me go back to, um, to show that. So the cellular automaton that's on this line of the Sierpinski gasket shows some lines, shows just shows some dots here, and the rest is white. Because you see, where it goes through the, the vertical, uh, the down-pointing triangles, those are white, those are, there's a gap. So all you see are just some little vertical lines. Can you, looking at the single one-dimensional line deduced that the Sierpinski gasket has this beautiful nested structure? The answer is no, but that single line, the cellular automaton, does have regularity and symmetry. So the self-similarity and scaling on the complex two-dimensional object, which was our triangle, it shows as a, a reduced coherent patterns, but still there are coherent patterns with similarity and scaling on the one-dimensional cellular automaton. Now, continuing in this, uh, in this uh, conjectural uh, direction, how can we connect coherent structures in n dimensions, since we live in three dimensions? Well, it just so happens that I, uh, the, the answer exists in mathematics, because mathematicians are used to uh, eating um, n dimensions, where n is any number, they eat it like a breakfast cereal, without any problems. If we inhabit a space that is bounded, like we are bounded in three dimensions, then we think that we cannot connect to something outside it. However, by going to one more dimension, we can jump over the boundary and connect. Let's think what this means. And I will, I will show a nice diagram that, that I obtained from the great um, uh, Russian mathematician, Israel Moiseyevich Gelfand, showing how it's possible to jump in three-dimensional space to get over the two-dimensional boundary. So suppose we live in a two-dimensional space that is bounded. We cannot get out of our two-dimensional space to connect to something outside. What we do is put our two-dimensional space into a three-dimensional space, and then we make a little jump. You see, you have to jump up. So you need a third dimension. You can jump up, and then you go outside and make the connection to the outside. So uh, for whatever it's worth, this diagram uh, hopefully will raise some, um, some ideas and, and raise some questions. I have raised questions without answering them. The best kind of questions to, to raise. Uh, about connecting to a higher state of order. How do we make this jump out of physical three-dimensional space of buildings so as to connect to a realm beyond three dimensions? Well, the religions tell us that this is possible. I am not qualified to to discuss the religious aspects, but there are many people who claim that this is possible. So let's see. There are also mathematical and physical questions about these extra dimensions, dimensions more than three. Are the additional dimensions of our existence interior or exterior? I think it's a very good uh, question, and I have not um, heard anyone raise this before. The spiritual approach imagines a world outside our everyday realm. So. Just the, the English words tells you that there's something outside three dimensions. However, the physicists who have discovered the dimensions, the extra dimensions, have discovered dimensions inside, the internal symmetry of the elementary particles.
The uh, conjectural picture presented here highlights questions about connecting to a higher order, whether the dimensions are inside or outside. It's, 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 a, it's a question that the philosophers can debate for, for many years. Uh, Christopher Alexander addresses this topic using empirical evidence presented in the Nature of Order Book 4, The Luminous Ground, which I recommend that everyone read. Have we reached the limits of biology? How high can we rise in our emotional connection and still explain it biologically? We do get emotional high from love, music, art, architecture, poetry, literature. The mechanisms of response are all due to our sensory uh, apparatus. They're biological. Although the most important elements are still incompletely understood. It is a uh, human beings are capable of, of, of an emotional response that far it goes far beyond our, our purely animal uh, qualities, just of finding a mate or, or finding food or avoiding a, a predator. I'm interested in the conditions for sacred connection, but I'm not interested in the mystical properties. Uh, I'm, I'm a scientist, and I'm interested in the geometrical qualities, trying to understand that, um, these connections. So let me look at, at, at existing ways of connecting. There are existing ways of connecting through dance, music, art, and architecture. And each one of these uh, endeavors uh, features patterns, regularity, repetition, nesting, hierarchy, fractal structure, scaling, all that I have uh, been discussing in the series of lectures so far. The highest artistic expression is often related to religion. In the West, we are proud to have Bach, Mozart, Botticelli, Michelangelo, the Islamic world is, is, a, is, is a highly connective uh, world, and there are uh, so many anonymous artists and architects of the Islamic art and architecture. By seeking God, human beings attain the highest level of connection to the universe. Any religious person will tell you that. Spirituality can lead to connectivity, and it has nothing to do with any particular organized religion. Is this the same mechanism as biophilia, something I've I mentioned before. Biophilia is the um, intrinsic connection we have with other living beings through our common genes, and we relate to them. Is it the same connection? I don't know. Maybe it is. Or it could be a more advanced and more intense uh, connection that we need and, and we, we thrive upon, and uh, it nourishes our body, as, as many uh, religious people will tell you. This is this emotional and physical nourishment. So how can we transcend biological connection to achieve an even higher spiritual connection? I cannot answer that, but again, I'm going to look for mathematical qualities. I cannot explain religious belief because it's an abstract concept resident in the mind. But the methods of connecting to the higher realm are through geometry, music, rhythm, color, and our senses. And the connection is very physical. It's intensely physical for those who, who achieve it. It's the mystical experience. Dance. All cultures have mystic dances that have a religious purpose. Bharatanatyam, the classical Indian dancing. For centuries, people connect to the Hindu gods through, through the dance. Uh, African shamanic dancing. Native American religious dance, the whirling dervishes in Mevlana, Turkey, Hasidic dancing, all these are mystical dancing, um, the mystical dance forms. If you analyze them coldly as a mathematician, you find the geometrical qualities of, 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 of scaling, repetition, uh, scaling coherence. Uh, in music, sitting down and listening to music or playing music, uh, we have the, 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 um, the religious uh, music of the West, the masses of Bach, Haydn, and Mozart. Uh, they have been studied uh, intensely by mathematicians. You can read um, uh, many articles on, uh, uh, on the music of Bach and, and Mozart showing the fractal temporal structure, exactly what I'm talking about, only it occurs in, in the temporal dimension in the music. Uh, the sacred chant in all religions connects the individual to something there, through the, through, the, through the chant, through singing. For example, the, the, the Passion uh, plays, uh, the St. Matthew Passion of Bach, the Byzantine Easter service, uh, the Kol Nidra during Yom Kippur, a Buddhist ceremonial chant. All of these connect 
the individual. And again, uh, calming down the calming down the body that gets excited when it connects in this way. It's an overwhelming experience if you've had it. And I hope most people have had it. Uh, uh, analyzing from the cold eye of the mathematician, you find the same nested patterns that I'm talking about in, in the scaling hierarchy, in the structure of the music itself. So there is something there mathematical. And finally, we come to architecture, sacred architecture. All over the world, regardless of the culture or regardless of the specific religion, the house of God displays the qualities that we seek to the highest possible extent. Namely, I seek and my friends seek these mathematical qualities of, 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 of scaling and, and, and hierarchy and, and, and recursion. Independent of particular religion or style, and it is found among all religious building types, whether a temple in Japan, a great mosque in, in, uh, in, uh, in Iran, um, a, um, a cathedral in Europe, a, a, uh, a church in Mexico. All of these share the same, the same type. So architects of the past instinctively build according to rules for scale and coherence. This is something that is observed. To conclude, all the examples I have mentioned have common mathematical qualities. Fractal symmetries, rhythm, hierarchy, scaling distribution, etc. They are deliberate, deliberate creations by humanity the world over, trying to connect to something out there, or is it inside there? I have raised questions without answering them, and I'm glad to have done that. I would like this series of lectures to uh, stimulate thought and investigations, to make connections that perhaps people um, had not made before. I take this from my friend Christopher Alexander. Just uh, talking to him for half an hour, you make 50 different connections, and then you're left for the next year pursuing these connections. I, I, like to, I like to do that. So in this lecture, I've not presented any data. You do this in order to create a nice window. No, that's in, in other uh, lectures in the series. But I have uh, presented complex ideas and, and uh, links by analogy, and I maybe criticize that these links are, are far out and not clearly established. But many of them, I believe, I'm uh, making for the first time so even if these things are not well defined, I hope uh, they will give rise to, to some investigation and food for thought, and we desperately need that in order to create that architecture for the 21st century. So this is all for today. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert, I'm finished.